Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Fabian Achimbeni from the Eden Executive Committee, and I'm glad to welcome you to the third webinar organized by Eden in the frame of the Open Education Week 2018. It is a very, it's becoming a tradition for Eden to organize uh, online events uh, in the frame of the, of the OE week. And uh, today we are going to talk about grassroots educators. Uh, so we have with us uh, four uh, examples for uh, real flesh and blood uh, educators uh, who define themselves uh, with different degrees, open educators. And this is exactly the logic of the, of the day, to hear from their voices what it means to be an open educator in their daily practice, what they do and what their institution is doing, what are the main challenges they have to overcome, what are the, their ideas also for, for other educators that would like to explore and to experiment with the open practices and open educational resources. Uh, so thank you very much to, to Michaela, Carmen, Anna Maria and Duane. <clears throat> I will... Uh, not really introduce themselves, just give them the word. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, notes for the audience. If you have any questions, please, or comment, please uh, use the chat so that we can then pick them up with the, with the speakers. And please note that uh, every speaker will, will have some 15 minutes for his, present, his or her presentation and, uh, and leaving some space uh, within these 15 minutes for some uh, questions or discussions so that we keep at the end some 20 minutes for, uh, for a, I would say, a joint discussion. And the objective of this joint discussion is, is to do actually something that is being doing uh, continuously in the open education world. So to try to understand um, what could be done by educators in order to open up their practices. But the idea of this webinar is really to, to try to distill these ideas and these recommendations from the voices and from the ideas of uh, uh, grassroots educators, that is the title of of this webinar and of course uh, with uh, with uh, with the participants uh, the webinar will be recorded is being recorded and will be available in the eden website so in case uh, some colleagues of yours can cannot attend now please let them know that uh, that the webinar will be available okay we start with the first presentation uh, let me put it on so i'm now happy to welcome michaela banek zorica or Dorica, I don't know the pronunciation, associate professor from the University of Zagreb, and uh, actually, um, I would say, uh, an interesting example of, uh, of uh, what it means to integrate uh, openness <clears throat> within, uh, within uh, teaching in a very, in a very grassroots uh, way. So let's hear from, uh, from Michaela uh, about her experience. Michaela. Give me a second. Okay. Hope you can all hear me and see me. Um, hello from Croatia. Um, uh, Fabio, you're right. Actually, without K, so it's Zorica. But anyhow. Um, okay. So. <laughs> not see. You, you cannot. See. We can hear you, but we cannot. No. Uh, start you. Wait just a second. Okay. Can you see me now? Perfect. Now we can, yes. So, um, Go ahead. first, um, let, well, 15 minutes is, is very short and I'm, I'm going to try to be very brief. Um, first, let me tell you, um, uh, when first I was asked to do this presentation, I was uh, thinking, oh, 15 minutes to present what I do. Um, am I really an open educator or not? So I did a lot of questioning myself and then I'm, I'm, I realized I'm going to, Organize this talk as a walk. Michaela, I okay. Uh, what I was thinking, um, I like to play games. So this could be a short walkthrough, you know, like <clears throat> in a, um, when you play a game and you don't know um, how to go to the next level, what you need to do, 
you go online and uh, look at the walkthrough. So this was intended more as a walkthrough how to pass certain steps uh, and how to um, pass certain levels. So um, when I say, am I an open educator, um, I, why I question myself, it's not uh, actually maybe my first choice. It's not something that I um, maybe wanted to do from the start, but was more forced to do. Um, so the case in Croatia, uh, students um, actually are supported by the government, government. The ones that enroll into faculty, uh, the majority of them actually uh, don't have to pay tuition fee. Uh, what at my faculty we try to do is um, offer them all the resources in our library, so we don't expect them to buy textbooks. So um, from the very beginning we could say that um, we try to be open, we try to use what government already funds and to give uh, that back to our students. Why I say um, I have problems with, with this is and, and why I was maybe forced to be an open educator is I can't expect my students to pay for a, a software, uh, to pay uh, uh, for something else additional to the uh, to the tuition that could be as a tuition fee. So I don't, I didn't have any resources, uh, any funds, um, but I wanted to modernize my education. So luckily, uh, with the emergence of um, social networks and social web. Um, I started using um, open resources that were already available, uh, that were already out there, um, using um, academic uh, social networks to um, guide my students to go and um, try to look for authors uh, on ResearchGate, on academia, and to see if their papers are uh, published uh, online. So that they can use them free of charge. Um, of course, uh, my faculty also buys large databases, so uh, they could access uh, literature uh, via a library, but I always sort of uh, push them forward to explore and find um, open resources. So um, what I did, just a short, as you can see, I, I used videos to, to enable Flip's classroom. Um, I tried to um, push them into uh, collaboration, uh, not only um, in the LMS. Uh, first I started with wikis and then I wanted them to more reflect on their research uh, process. So I used uh, either uh, Twitter for microblogging or they were um, creating their own uh, blogs and then with uh, networks like Tumblr, uh, they were able to, to create their own um, networks, blog networks and uh, then they could communicate and share. Um, of course, during the um, period of Second Life, uh, we uh, also went there and uh, tried to um, modify the existing sources. So uh, they would either uh, program the objects uh, to suit their needs um, or they would um, uh, create new uh, objects that, that then would could be reused and uh, modified. So uh, what I'm guiding myself through is the five hours of David Wiley. So um, nowadays I'm pushing my students to uh, build um, e-courses or, or at least parts of e-courses um, by using um, existing materials and then um, modifying them and uh, remixing them. So um, again, I just wanted to tell you, um, I, I've given you um, my background, I've given you um, the, the info about uh, the funding uh, in education in Croatia. So um, what still I'm having problems uh, with is that these all initiatives are teachers' initiatives. So, um, in general, 
there is a support on paper, but in, in practice, um, maybe not so much. So um, I use this slide sort of to, to reflect what current situation is in Croatia. So we um, have open access and we have open data, and this is what uh, everyone is actually working on, and uh, all the documents and all initiatives are going that way. But with open education, this coming soon um, seems to reflect what we um, unfortunately have in here. So I've, I've used, just to show you, I've used um, compared two uh, repositories. So one of them is Dabar, which is the Croatian uh, Digital Academic uh, Repository, which is a good initiative. Um, but majority of the items that are reposited there are uh, textual. Um, there are either thesis uh, or uh, graduate thesis. Uh, there are um, papers. But uh, what um, I'm lacking is any uh, proper educational materials, like, uh, for instance, tests with which uh, our teachers build and, and update and have great databases which they are not sharing with anyone. Um, not that they don't want to, but simply they don't know how. They, they need something, some in, incitement to do that. Um, on the other hand, I just took just one library, it was uh, picked by random, University of Texas, where um, I've, I've seen a lot of resources, so um, either uh, finding or, or remixing or creating uh, open educational resources. Um, so um, this is the thing that I feel is, is um, uh, currently lacking in Croatia and uh, this is something that um, I would like people to work more on it. Um, because all of the things that I was telling you uh, about, what, what I feel, they're not real open resources, um, because there would also people um, say when they publish papers, they're for pen sources. So um, all of these sources are actually gated. Um, the materials are on, on uh, this social network site, you have to log in, so they're actually not free. Um, although I'm using them and, and in the context of open education, also I feel that they're not really open and they are um, somewhere else. Um, the only thing that um, is open and that, uh, that we have are the, the LMSs, which are open source um, platforms. So um, I try to keep this short. Maybe I've, I've gone through it too fast. Um, but what I feel that, that we are lacking in, in Croatia is uh, more co collaboration on open education as open educational resources, which um, we uh, all are not sharing that much. OK, thank you. This was, this was a. Really fast, maybe too fast. <laughs> this this was perfect, Michaela, because it leaves us it leaves us some time for for questions. In fact, we have already a couple of questions by Wayne, and I'm inviting the others also to put their questions in the chat. So the first question by Wayne has to do with uh, personal data, and the question goes like this: How do colleagues feel your your colleagues feel about requiring learners to sacrifice giving up personal data by requiring use of proprietary off offshore services. So are they aware? Is it a problem for them that by using proprietary solutions they are giving away their data? Um, unfortunately, um, I mean, they are aware of it. Um, this is a sacrifice uh, that they're accepting to do, uh, both colleagues uh, and students, um, because there is no other solution. So we are uh, aware of it, but on the other hand, we are forced. Um, otherwise, you will not use it. Uh, what um, happened when we um, used the um, 
the things that are in, in our LMS, students were not that much interested in this. They, they would rather use um, social networks and I think they're actually not aware of the sacrifice that they are doing. We are constantly um, uh, informing them and, and saying this to them, but they're saying, okay, if I can pay only with my data because I can't afford to pay with money. So this is the unfortunate thing, but it's reality. And I would I'm like sure that Wayne that has some changed. ideas on this. Maybe, Wayne, uh, we keep uh, this for your uh, intervention if you want to say something about uh, how to get over this, uh, this issue. That, well, in fact, it is already something that people, uh, that your fellow um, teachers are aware of this, because awareness is normally the first uh, thing. Many, many people don't care because don't know yes. about it or don't really know what that means, so it is good. But once you are aware of that, I think uh, some solutions can be found, at least to partially overcome this issue. But uh, I'm, I'm asking Wayne to keep this um, idea warm for um, later on when I'm going to give him uh, the word. Uh, I have another question. Uh, this is a very, in my understanding, a very critical one, again by Wayne. Uh, if a course requires password access, can we say it is open? What's your view, Michaela? No, that, that I agree completely with Wayne, and that, that's why my first sentence. Am I open or am I not open? Um, in, in general, um, um, I, maybe one or two courses are open. Uh, to have a, a, a policy that everything is, is open without a, um, a credential, so without a login and password, um, I don't think so. Um, so that's why my reservation, I try to be as open as possible, but um, seeing uh, the large initiatives and, and what open is, um, in order to be such, uh, I need to get support from my institution, which I don't get. So um, I, I get support for LMS, but not the support okay. to have a Thank completely yes, open this is, uh, course. I, mean, I think already asking yourself if you are an open educator and, and let's say see how to move along this in the future is a, is, is a pretty important point. Uh, Lisa Marie, if you don't mind, I would like to keep your question for the final debate because actually that is the, I would say, the, the most critical question, how to move from paper to practice. So how can convinced open educators actually advocate for a system to change? So I will keep this for the, for the final discussion. And then we have a comment by Alastair saying that in Sweden there is still a general resistance to OER still only at, at enthusiast level in universities and he suspects the situation is similar in many more countries. What's, the, what's your view from, uh, from Croatia? Michaela. With, with the, we are currently just making people aware of the open access to the materials which is a great initiative currently in Croatia, and um, as I'm telling you, it's just with the, with the papers, with the open access and the open data, while the education, with, with the educational resources, they are still in the back. I expect that they will be the next phase, uh, but uh, for now, the resistance is still with the with the with the papers, uh, with the publishing, and uh, uh, teachers still need to be educated on 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 this side. And then afterwards comes the, the open education as open educational resources. Um, when you talk to the teachers, they would like to share. Uh, they uh, they think that they have uh, valuable resources and they would like to share resources and update their resources, but they don't know how. Actually, they don't know how. Okay, yes. That, uh, if they're telling me there is some echo. I will try to find a different mic. 
Um, okay, I have a last question for you, apart from the, um, there is a, a, a statement by Alistair that open access has become accepted, but OER not which is, I think, uh, difficult to disagree with. It is uh, also a matter of, I think, cycle. So, yes, open access is pos possibly, I would say, easier to be adopted in technical terms. But still, this is a, a different discussion. Uh, I have a, um, a point, uh, a question by, um, by Cynthia. She says uh, she thinks teaching practice, uh, I would say open teaching practice, would need more recognition. What's your view on this? With the, the distance education, uh, so e-learning, when we started, it, it was just a couple of us, you can um, number us uh, by hand, um, that were going into e-learning and working with e-learning. And then um, only after it was recognized by the university, um, the, we created, the university created the award system. Um, so everyone else wanted to join. I think the similar thing is with uh, open education. Um, we need uh, more support. Um, currently there is not that much support. I'm telling you the support is focused only on, on um, open access uh, and it's slowly uh, heading towards uh, open education, educational resources. But to have a platform where we can share resources, where we can find and modify resources. Currently, no. Um, for the, I'm speaking about the university level. There are now initiatives for the um, primary and secondary school. Uh, there is a repository built, and teachers can um, uh, share their materials. So, uh, on a on a lower. Uh, educational scale, there are some um, initiatives going on, but for the university level, higher education level, we still need them. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michaela, a virtual okay. clap for you, uh, not only for your presentation, but for the work you are doing. We will now move to the next speaker and please uh, stay with us for the final discussion. In the meantime, um, a dialogue is going on uh, in the chat between Alistair, Wayne and others, which is exactly what, what should happen, so please follow that there. And I'm now inviting, uh, um, I'm now inviting Carmen to take the mic and the floor and the screen, I would say. Let me get her presentation. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can we, can we see you all? Glad to be here with you. Yes, please. Can you hear me, we please? We can hear you, but not, we can hear you, okay. but not see so, you. Uh, Carmen, Carmen Hello. can we also see you? Um, okay. Yes, I think you can see me now. Okay. Glad to be here with you. I'm Carmen Holotescu, a professor of uh, computer science from uh, Ioan Slavic University of Timișoara, Romania. And I would like to share with you a few ideas about uh, the practices in my universities, about the practices I, with, I use with my students, and then to provide you a few links uh, towards the available initiatives in uh, my country. Uh, first of all, the project, I suppose a lot of us know about this, Open Edu, uh, which um, published a lot of uh, available studies and uh, frameworks, and of course will be a useful uh, reference for our work and uh, research. Uh, then I'm very happy that um, I uh, can meet you, um, very valuable researcher. Uh, here I have uh, a paper of uh, Fabio, you can see. It's uh, very work. I uh, put a lot of notes on uh, your paper uh, in search for the the Open uh, Educator, I uh, started uh, to study it a few months ago. Very good um, work. Okay, now let's see 
about some practices in uh, my uh, university. We try to continuously improve the blended uh, courses we offer to our uh, students to integrate uh, open educational resources uh, and MOOCs. Uh, together with uh, a few of my uh, colleagues, we uh, recognize uh, some practical uh, work of our uh, students in uh, external uh, MOOCs, if they participate in such MOOCs. Uh, then we have uh, practices for integrating MOOCs in our own courses, and uh, I present you a few things about this. Then we uh, kindly recommend our teachers to follow at least two MOOCs each year, one related to uh, new technologies in education, to practices related to open education, and one related to their topics uh, of uh, research and of teaching. We have a very uh, active community of practice for teachers. Uh, then we try to be active uh, participants in the Romanian Coalition for Open Educational Resources, to participate in organizing uh, conferences and workshops on open education, and um, we are uh, piloting now um, a project to issue uh, digital certificates on uh, blockchain for our students. This will be the first university with uh, such a practice in uh, Romania. Okay, I will answer to the question. Thank you, Wayne, a little later. Then, uh, let's see how I blend MOOCs in um, my uh, courses, a practice I started um, four or five years ago. There are a few variants to blend massive uh, open online courses in uh, a university course. Uh, you can um, direct your, uh, you can guide, you can facilitate for your students to use part of uh, quality MOOCs as the open educational resources. So uh, to enlarge the content of your course with part of the MOOC. Or your students can be part of the global communities of uh, these massive uh, courses and to participate also in uh, the exercises, projects, forums, discussion forums, of um, the massive open online courses. This practice I used uh, with my students for um, the courses I teach, multimedia, object-oriented programming, and started, starting with uh, this year, a course related to blockchain development, again, the first such uh, university course in uh, my country. Which are the aims for such a practice? This way, students are allowed to become familiar with uh, massive open online courses. Uh, they will be able to search and to evaluate useful and quality uh, massive open online courses. Uh, they enlarge their um, knowledge about uh, the topics of the course this way. Uh, they will become continuously uh, learners for uh, their uh, whole life this way. And uh, they um, will be able to have uh, a critical evaluation for uh, the usefulness of uh, the MOOCs for uh, their personal uh, development. Uh, which are the steps for MOOCs integration? First of all, um, having the guidance from uh, the teacher, they discover and uh, select the MOOCs in which to participate, um, starting from a description for uh, the MOOCs and uh, from a few useful um, directories for uh, massive open online courses. They participate 
in um, a part of the MOOC, depending uh, on the topic of uh, the course. Uh, they will present their learning experience as a digital uh, story. This way, uh, their colleagues, their peer, peers will um, be able to um, be part of uh, the learning experience. And then they will uh, evaluate their uh, participation. I uh, put on the following uh, slide. Uh, possible activities in the, blended in the blended course and also the benefits. I will not um, insist on this. Uh, those who are uh, interested uh, will be able to find uh, this on uh, the registration of the meeting. Uh, very briefly, for the students, the benefit will be that um, they will be able to assess their own learning needs. Uh, they will be exposed to high quality material created uh, with top educational technologies by top universities in the world. Uh, then they will be able to collaborate in global learning communities and this way to broad their range of experiences. For teachers, they will uh, obtain new skills, uh, but their task will be more complex uh, because the design and the management of the course will become more complex. Uh, it's uh, in a way um, difficult but uh, challenging to evaluate the distributed and uh, collaborative activities of your students to facilitate the local learning community and uh, to integrate it in the um, global community of uh, learners. But this way, as a teacher, you can improve your knowledge in your own area, but also uh, related to open educational practices and you will become more open, you will become a real open educator, and you can um, be um, a starting point, you can be an inspiration for um, your colleague. Your colleague, sorry. Here there are a few links uh, that uh, will um, guide you to available initiatives in Romania related to open educational resources. Um, a recent um, international um, article just found that Romania is uh, the fourth most productive country in um, studies related to open educational resources. And uh, of course, I uh, hope to have to continue our communication, not uh, only during this webinar, but um, in the following uh, days and months. Uh, you can find here my uh, Twitter account, uh, also uh, the link to my uh, research, and uh, I'm very happy to be with you. And of course, I will try to answer to the question you put um, in the chat area. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. A very, a very, I would say, complete uh, description of how MOOCs can be integrated into, into, I would say, sorry, into curriculum. Uh, I'm picking up a couple of questions for you, whilst others are still typing, so please don't be shy with the questions. So the first question has to do with the perceptions of students. Uh, uh, basically, Wayne is asking, um, um, is saying that one reaction, uh, typical reaction about integrating MOOCs into campus program is that students can say, I'm here to study at your university, not another university. Are you trying to cut costs by using someone else's course? Did you get uh, sometimes the, the feeling that this is a, is a concern of students or maybe a, let's say a thought in the head of students? Uh, no, I uh, never uh, 
received such uh, an opinion from uh, my students, uh, they were very happy to find this new way to learn and uh, I could uh, find that um, after uh, integrate MOOCs in uh, my courses, uh, for other uh, courses in university, they started to follow MOOCs related to those topic, topics in order to improve their knowledge. Even if um, uh, the teachers who teach uh, those courses uh, didn't recognize the participation in MOOCs, they follow Massive Open Online courses for uh, their, uh, for improving their knowledge. Um, this is a comment that can be received, but of course, as I was writing in the chat, is balanced by a number of other, of other issues like innovation or perception of innovation or even uh, prestige. Um, another interesting comment, uh, possibly barrier by Alistair, he said that the major problem for teachers that want uh, to, to embed MOOCs into their teaching is to get access to potential MOOCs because you can only access them as a registered student during the, regist during the course period. How did you, did you experience this problem? How did you go about it? Uh, uh, of course, MOOC started uh, in 2008 by being three courses. Uh, then, uh, many platforms uh, started to have um, embedded MOOCs in uh, nano degrees or uh, specialities and so on, and you have to pay for a uh, few of them. But many platforms offer um, free courses, uh, and also you can find the um, MOOCs in which you can enter at um, uh, every moment. So uh, you can uh, use the, them in a carousel way, not only uh, during a few weeks in which uh, the, those MOOCs to be open. So uh, we um, try to find only free solutions for uh, the students. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, actually, this seems to be a, 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 a problematic point for, for many teachers. Actually, what we are, um, what we are uh, starting to research, uh, this is uh, also an invitation for others if you are interested in joining this mini movement, is uh, if an educational exception, like the copyright exception, but an, educa an educational exception for MOOCs could be, could, be, um, could be put forward. Actually, let's say, if, uh, when MOOCs uh, are used or could be used by educators, not by, by self-directed uh, self learners, they could be treated differently in terms of license and in terms of uh, openness, in terms of duration. So this is an interesting concept. It's actually, uh, it's, a, it's another level of closeness sort of, uh, um, of MOOCs. Actually, another comment had to do with uh, the, the fact that MOOCs are not really uh, OER, most of them. Uh, so you cannot modify them. You have to take them as they come. And uh, you you never had this problem, no? I wanted to modify something in the MOOC, but of course then you cannot do it. How do you go about it when you find something that is, uh, I mean, that you would like to modify or to adapt? Okay, maybe I was uh, not, not um, um, very clear. Uh, those MOOCs, are used as additional uh, resources for the course. So um, I provide uh, central content for the course, and then this content is enlarged with uh, the content of the MOOCs. So uh, uh, the students are not um, guided only towards okay. the MOOCs. Okay. So um, I open my course towards the book, towards the uh, different uh, experts, uh, different social media platforms. One so option. books are only a part. Okay, so of, they can uh, they course. can stay as they are because they can they complement. I understand very well. Okay, a last question. Okay.
The last question for you. You mentioned, and this okay. I didn't know, congratulations, that you are the first university in Romania that uh, is offering blockchain uh, certificates, to say it in, in a word. And uh, Wayne is asking, do the certificates you offer on blockchain qualify for formal academic credit towards degree at your university? Um, in this case, they will be only additional certificates because uh, it's a pilot project and um, of course it will uh, take some time to have uh, an official recognition. But we can, uh, uh, we want to have this pilot project in order to be able to come with some uh, recommendations for uh, our uh, Ministry of Education. But, of course, of you, course. Can, you have to start from okay, piloting. Okay, that's uh, uh, also a very interesting development. Thank you very much. It's sort of opening up somehow the, the, the certification process in technical terms. Okay, thank you very much. I'm asking you also to, to stay with us, of course, until the end for the final debate. So you have a couple of points that I will... Uh, that I will bring up later. Yes, uh, you also are getting some congratulations to the chat, through the chat. I'm now inviting, so a virtual clap for you also, uh, Carmen. I'm inviting now Anna Maria Tamaro from uh, Parma University, who will let us know about uh, another uh, MOOC-related activity, I would say, which uh, has been Pretty successful. It is actually quite successful, uh, and uh, it deals with digital libraries. Uh, Anna Maria has a, I would say, very broad ex and, and, and long experience in trying to integrate technologies and openness into 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 education. We wrote together a couple of papers on on open education and OER in Italy. So um, I, I see some questions about the general um, situations in the country. So Anna Maria, if you also want to mention briefly some points on Italy, I think that would be interesting, but apart from your personal experience, but I will shut up now and leave you the word. with expert about this very innovative pedagogy of open education. Um, and so um, I uh, prepare um, the uh, presentation about uh, the MOOC experience, but uh, I have a long uh, experience of a distance teacher. Uh, I'm teaching at the moment in DIL, DIL um, Stay for Digital Library Learning. It's a joint course um, with um, Oslo in Tallinn and Parma, and we have uh, distance students uh, spread uh, in the world. But uh, um, I think that the MOOC was um, uh, going deaf for me in the innovation of open pedagogy. Just to reply to the suggestion of, of um, uh, Fabio about the situation in Italy, uh, it's exactly what you have already <laughs> said, uh, similar to Romania, similar to Croatia. Um, I think that uh, uh, there are innovators. Um, I think to be one of these, <laughs> the, there are uh, teachers uh, less or more enthusiastic of uh, using uh, openness uh, tools and uh, other um, approach, philosoph philosophical approach. Uh, but uh, the policy and the government and the institutional support is very weak. But uh, I'm sure it will change. Uh, and so just to start with my presentation, then we can come back to single point uh, of the situation in Italy. Uh, my motivation uh, was exactly to, to uh, try an innovative approach uh, to facilitate learning. Um, there are in a way many challenges uh, for the, the teacher first and um, my idea to put uh, the learners uh, and also the students uh, into the digital library as evidence uh, that there are some obstacles but also I focused on key drivers and uh, I could evaluate uh, doing the research uh, 
for the participants in, in some uh, key drivers we can we can consider. And then uh, I will share with you my reflection and also what I think to do differently. The MOOC has been uh, delivered uh, starting from 2016 and uh, we plan to reopen now in uh, this year, in June and then in uh, September. Um, okay, um, I don't see any more my presentation, Fabio, sorry, <laughs> and so um, my philosophy, my philosophy is uh, related to my topic, uh, information science is my discipline and the digital library is the subject uh, I teach, and unfortunately it's a very controversial subject, there are two approach, one centered on collection, you build the collection, then the user will come, and the second is instead centered on user. This is my motivation to put the user into the digital library, not the customization, not the personalization of the interface, but really try to experiment how I can engage participant and to be active in the digital library. My idea, my philosophy is that the digital library is immersive, should be integrated into the lives of people. And so I am very ambitious, I know. But um, in, in part, uh, the MOOC has um, given some result in this sense. Uh, the MOOC participants were in total 1,213. And uh, uh, I wanted uh, uh, not to have uh, only uh, um, students, I wanted to have uh, teachers, and this is why, in fact, uh, uh, most of the participants, you see 65%, were teachers, teachers of all levels of school from elementary school, primary school to high school. Uh, we have had uh, a law uh, for the, the school uh, in uh, 2017, and this has facilitated, uh, 2016, sorry, and this has uh, facilitated the active participation of many teachers. And also new profile, for example, facilitators of uh, continuing development, uh, also uh, we call uh, uh, Identity digitale, facilitating digital technology ap application in teaching. Uh, only 15% uh, were professionals in the digital library sector. And so a very heterogeneous mass of uh, participants with a very uh, different background. And this was really a challenge. Also, uh, pedagogy is uh, um, very important and also very demanding. Uh, the innovators, uh, the teachers who want to use open uh, pedagogy should be aware that there are two pedagogical approach, uh, uh, especially in traditional teaching, uh, also not using uh, technology. The uh, traditional approach to teaching is to think that the person you have in front probably the student, don't know anyway, don't know um, anything, is uh, completely unaware of a topic. Uh, and so uh, the um, teaching is uh, information centered, uh, based on transmission of information. Uh, instead, uh, um, in the lifelong framework, uh, lifelong learning framework and the adult education, uh, with this MOOC participant, a very disomogeneous uh, the importance is uh, to be learning centered. Uh, and this is uh, really a big change uh, of perspective uh, in uh, teaching. Uh, I started first to analyze the context of the participant. They have filled the questionnaire and uh, also I asked to, to all of them to do a presentation. Um, I think that uh, in uh, this uh, open pedagogy, uh, the most important uh, uh, thing is the support of the platform. This was my experience. I used Emma platform. Uh, this is a very open platform and is uh, supporting the teacher in the full cycle of the course, from the creation to the certification. 
And so really, um, all the activities uh, to be done are um, supported by this platform. I have used, uh, I am using many platforms in my teaching experience. Really, um, I think that um, this is the first platform I found, uh, including all the activities to be done. And, uh, um, for example, uh, I appreciate very much, I will say more, uh, stimulating the conversation. Uh, there is possibility of blog, forum, there is possibility of uh, student creative, participant, I can say, uh, creating uh, content and so on. Uh, and so my idea of digital library, I already explained to you, is very different from stereotype of a digital library as uh, put a book online, is not only digital resource, it's a virtual space, it's a learning space, and can be also immersive, in, in, embedded in the lives of participants, and so can be, for example, a laboratory in the class. Anyway, uh, there was a first satisfaction survey done by Ipsos, Unfortunately, not many uh, participants reply to this uh, questionnaire, and so the results are based only on 6% of the participants, which considering the 1,000 of participants is, um, in any way, not uh, very few. And uh, you see uh, in the uh, uh, strong uh, green, the, there was um, a good uh, satisfaction uh, range in general 60%. And then uh, all the lessons uh, were ranked uh, with uh, different um, uh, satisfaction. But this uh, satisfaction survey um, was not uh, satisfactory for me, and I wanted to do more. And so I asked to one of the deal, uh, master deal student to do a thesis investigating uh, more what uh, were the key drivers for improving learning in the perception of the user. Um, the uh, student was uh, Carla Columbati and uh, she uh, approached the topic from the user experience point of view. And so considering uh, uh, all the element of the MOOC. Um, and um, um, uh, this is uh, interesting, uh, just uh, as a, a panorama of the key drivers, uh, and then you see that uh, what was uh, considered the, the important for learning uh, is in the center, is uh, sharing, and then uh, interaction. Um, and then discussion. Sharing a discussion is related to the community of participants, and so community of learners. Interaction is related to the teacher. Um, peer assessment is related to the community too. Going uh, to uh, explain better, uh, community sharing is uh, really related uh, to the possibility uh, the student, uh, the participant in the MOOC have to create content. This means that for each unit, I just uh, started uh, um, uh, to put the underline in the video, but especially in the description, the main point, but doing a question. And then there was the discussion by the student, uh, very animated discussion, very um, uh, uh, populated, and at the end there was a synthesis. And so um, uh, this was uh, uh, what um, uh, we experimented together with co-teaching. Uh, for uh, many units I have involved in the conversation, but also in the responsibility of doing uh, part of the content, the student or the alumni of the master deal. Uh, this was um, very interesting uh, for broadening the participant. I forgot to say that the MOOC is in three languages, uh, Italian, English and Spanish. But the student from the student come from different area too. There was one student also from New Zealand, 
and um, from Spain and, and so on. And, and um, this was enlarging uh, the community of uh, people interested in um, uh, digital library. And so co-creation, uh, you see, um, is uh, very well uh, considered. And uh, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, element uh, considered good uh, for um, in, uh, having improved the learning by people are uh, exactly co-creation. Uh, then interaction. Interaction is um, a point uh, I will uh, reflect uh, later more. It's very demanding uh, for the teachers. I try to post uh, every day one blog uh, post and also I prepare a weekly newsletter synthesizing uh, the course uh, for that week. Uh, and there were also two hangout sessions. Uh, planned uh, in the middle at, uh, at the end before the final submission of the assignment. Um, anyway, interaction, interaction um, is um, important for the participant, but they would like more. Uh, peer assessment was a learning experience too, and so uh, the participant were um, collaborating in uh, finding the indicators uh, to assess the assignment and then uh, um, giving feedback to their peer. And uh, this was um, uh, very well considered by most of the respondents. And finalizing uh, my presentation, what I will uh, like to do differently. Um, I know now uh, that uh, to be an innovator means uh, to perform multiple, multiple roles, uh, not only teaching, but uh, to design, to mentoring, uh, um, to market, and, uh, uh, and uh, also it's a very um, risky uh, exercise <laughs> because there is a lot of visibility. And uh, there are some obstacles uh, which were underlined by participants, time constraint, and also related more to my work, that uh, I was more demanding than their background. Uh, this is why I have to learn more and learn more uh, that uh, I have to know the background start from different level. And, and there is still technology difficulty also if uh, there are uh, so many platforms and uh, so many possibilities now. And I think that we have to do research. Um, usually research and teaching are considered uh, two different parts of the academic world, but uh, we uh, need uh, really combine information and learning. And uh, this is uh, what I plan to do in the next uh, two years, uh, but uh, also from the pedagogy, further research and assessment and feedback is needed. Uh, just uh, to conclude, uh, I think that the idea to have an international community uh, to share our teaching experience is uh, very important to reinforce best practice but also to discuss and collaborate doing research in controversial uh, issue. Um, I think uh, I can stop. I hope to, to have been uh, in the limit of the time, and I look for your question uh, to say more. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you very much, Anna Maria. Actually, I mean, I agree with you as uh, taking your last point that we need more exchange and we need an international an international community. Actually, we have Eden that is doing this pretty well, and, uh, and this year Eden is the Eden yearly conference is taking place in Genova in Italy. So it will be an occasion to try to get as many Italian <laughs> online and open educators together in mid June. So if you have not uh, registered yet, um, I, I advise you to do so. It's going to be an unforgettable event. And thank you very much. Also, you stayed into the time limit. I, uh, I will just take a couple of minutes, two, three minutes for questions, uh, not to leave, uh, not to not to eat all the time for the final commenting. Um, I think uh, 
let me see you here. Let me see the, the questions. Yes, Lisa Marie is uh, confirming, is agreeing that we need more reflective uh, practitioners. So the fact that the researchers and the, the, the teacher and the researcher should actually uh, should actually let's say uh, coincide and work, and work together sometimes also in the, in the very same person. Uh, I have a question myself. Why is other are, are reading? Actually, um, you say that uh, in in doing in order to do what you have been doing, a teacher must uh, transform itself himself or herself into a, a strange animal that is at the same time a teacher, a mentor, an expert, uh, an animator, a facilitator. And I think this is probably the, the, the biggest obstacle for, for teachers to, to take up this. I mean, it's uh, not so not only the, I mean, at least in Italy, but I think also many other Euro countries in Europe and, and abroad, uh, especially young teachers in their tenures have uh, not a lot of time. They are, uh, they are forced to publish uh, more than uh, any human being uh, could do. So they don't, they, even if they want to experiment with, uh, with open, with open, strategies as you say this takes time and takes time yeah. also to learn that to transform um, yeah. do you well do you see some uh, some uh, options some possibilities to 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 break this ver vicious circle uh, of uh, not enough time not enough uh, yeah. um, i would say incentives uh, and so at the end of the day a static uh, system do you see some uh, way out uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, a very crucial point. Um, we, s we spoke uh, before of uh, rewarding. Um, I can say uh, don't expect uh, rewarding recognition by the university. Uh, this uh, is valid for young career people, but also for uh, older ones. Um, uh, really, um, the only reward I consider is uh, the uh, feeling, uh, the part uh, participation, the interaction with students. And so a real educator is uh, rewarded by the feedback uh, in, uh, of the uh, student and uh, from the good human relation started uh, in also in this uh, distant uh, technology uh, pedagogy way. Uh, at the moment, at the moment, I hope it will change. Um, to, we are in a um, transition generation, and I, I am sure the university has to change, have to change. Um, and so our experience uh, uh, can be useful for the next uh, step. But um, I think that the only rewarding we can consider is uh, this uh, relation, human relation, uh, also mediated by computer. And uh, um, I don't expect uh, to have uh, anything else. It's very demanding, this is true. It's much more demanding than uh, teaching in a class. Not only for the number, but uh, because really you have to have uh, so m many multiple roles in uh, one time. Exactly. We have a comment there saying that sometimes technology makes students' life easier, but not teachers' life easier. It's, uh, it's a good point. Uh, last quick question: Do the teachers uh, in your in your environment get an official recognition in university for using? Uh, open educational practices, or this is, uh, un is passing under the radar? No, it's um, under-related. Under, uh, it's not considered at all. Uh, I okay. have another con very, <laughs> I have another suggestion. Uh, I do a question yeah. to myself. Uh, speaking of the change in the university, I was considering uh, doing uh, this uh, experience, but do we need uh, administration uh, still? Or we can think of uh, an educators without the university. What the university add? to what uh, is my work and what uh, add uh, to the platform. Having a platform like Emma, doing everything, but why do I need a university? <laughs> and this is a uh, question I have no answer. <laughs> this, is a, this is a question where, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 
it's an interesting one, I would say, but we should keep it, <laughs> I think, for future discussion. But yeah, you're right. I, mean, the, I think uh, what, is, what is really true is that the more the role of educators change, uh, also the role of others around the educator should change. I mean, the idea of any learning center doing everything, for example, when the educator just teaching is, uh, you know, is a, is a really an old one. And in some cases, still, the people in the famous learning center don't want to leave some space for, for others to experiment. So actually, it's a, in, a, in, a change, uh, in a change uh, perspective, it's not a, a absolutely, a, let's say, a, a naive question. It's an important one, I want to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think uh, uh, that a uh, lifelong learning approach is uh, doing the change. Is driving exactly. the change, li lifelong learning. Exactly. Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Anna Maria. Virtual clap for you also. We now move uh, to the only male presenter, which one day before uh, Women's Day is quite good, Wayne McIntosh from New Zealand. I'm getting your presentation online. I see you there, Wayne. Thank you for being with us. What time is it, uh, Sheyu? Good day, everyone. It's a sort of respectable hour. It's nine minutes after 10 in the evening, 10, uh, 10 p.m. So um, I've seen the future that's already happened. Um, you, you're all going to have a wonderful Wednesday. And um, let me wish you a happy Open Education Week. Uh, it, it's great to be able to join you, um, you know, uh, across the ocean, so to speak. And I guess I'm going to have to do a little bit of defense as to why a Kiwi from New Zealand uh, can gate crash a European uh, congregation uh, celebrating Open Education Week. But um, hopefully I'll be able to legitimize myself. And um, so, so what I hope to do is just very briefly give a bit of context around what we're doing with the OERU and um, then just reflect on some of our, uh, our open practices. So thanks for the opportunity. So I mean, I think one of the, uh, I, the, the, I need to start off that the OERU International Collaboration, which has uh, some 30 partners from five continents around the world, is first and foremost a charitable collaboration that is really trying to address a, a, a key challenge we are facing in tertiary education. Uh, we know that conservatively estimated that over you know, the next two decades we're going to have to provide an additional 100 million places uh, to uh, provide access to tertiary education and the majority of these learners that are qualified for seats in tertiary education will not be able to have the funding to afford the privilege of a tertiary education and the, this is the key challenge that we are trying to address at the OERU. I think a little, for example, what if uh, institutions were to assemble just two courses based entirely on open, edu open educational resources that learners could access at, at no cost? <clears throat> and what if those institutions agreed to provide assessment services uh, for formal academic credit? <clears throat> and that is essentially what, <clears throat> what we're doing here at the OERU. So just very briefly, uh, how the OERU works, uh, we assemble uh, courses based entirely on open access, uh, open access and OER. And, and being OER, we are able to provide these courses that are designed for independent study at no cost to all our learners. Our participating partners uh, provide assessment services on, on a fee-for-service basis uh, to earn transcript credit towards recognized degrees uh, within our partner network. We made good progress. Um, we are launching uh, in 2018 the OERU first year of study that will lead to two exit qualifications. The one is <coughs> a certificate of higher education in business that will be conferred by the University of the Highlands and Islands based in Scotland. Um, which I think is one of the reasons that can legitimate, uh, legitimate my contribution to the European conversation uh, in that we will have a European-based uh, qualification within OERU. And you can see the list of um, OER courses that have been assembled as open online courses. The other exit qualification we will be including in the first year of study is a Certificate of General Studies, um, also a first year qualification that will be conferred by Thompson Rivers University. 
And uh, you can see there the list of courses we have that uh, are really available as open online courses uh, that will be assessed by our partners for tr uh, transfer credit towards the uh, respective exit qualifications. One of the things we did early in the OERU design process is we assembled all our courses as micro courses, in part to address this, uh, the difference in sizes of courses uh, in different regions of the world. I mean, so for example, a typical course in North America, Canada, and the United States is um, typically 120 notional learning hours, where a course in New Zealand is typically 150 notional learning hours. Um, in the UK, for example, most modules are 200 notional learning hours. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we assembled all our OERU courses as micro courses equating to roughly 40 notional learning hours. And using the micro course model, we are able to establish a, a currency transfer, if you will, to deal with the differences in course sizes. So four micro courses would equate to a full course here in New Zealand and Australia. Three micro courses would equate to a full course in North America. <clears throat> and typically five micro courses would equate to a, model, a module in the UK environment. But you'll see the exciting potential we have with micro courses is the ability to issue micro credentials. And in fact, uh, we are launching a micro credential initiative through uh, uh, an initiative called the EduBits that has been spearheaded by one of our partners, Otago Polytechnic. And you get the idea, uh, a course like Introduction to Management uh, can be, in this case, is split into four micro courses. And learners can be assessed individually for each of those micro courses and earn the micro credentials. And if the learners successfully achieve the set of micro credentials, they will earn transcript credit. Uh, towards the Certificate of uh, Higher Education in Business at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Thinking a little bit uh, about open pedagogy, I, I realize it's, it's, it's quite a new concept and it's, it's still quite uh, contested in the literature, but I think one of the opportunities is, is to think about what can open do that closed can't. One, one of the opportunities is around uh, what we call free-range learning or the pedagogy of discovery. With the growing <clears throat> inventory of uh, open access and OER materials that are around the world, it is possible to design courses where learners go out and find their own resources in pursuit of their own learning interests uh, in achieving the learning outcomes for individual courses. And we have integrated the pedagogy of discovery in a large number of the OERU courses. Also, one of the key features of the OERU on the teaching side with regards to our delivery platform is we have designed our delivery model around teaching or learning on the internet as opposed to learning through a single application like a learning management system. Our open technology at the OERU is um, based entirely on open source technology. Uh, a key principle for us at the OERU is that no learner or educator should be required to sacrifice their freedoms in software choices uh, by requiring them to purchase a software license. So our entire development and delivery uh, infrastructure is open source. We author our courses uh, collaboratively using wiki technology. We use the same uh, wiki technology that drives the Wikipedia uh, website where <clears throat> our authors uh, distributed around the world collaborate in assembling an outline of individual wiki pages. And we have open source technologies and scripts that are able to produce a snapshot of um, these collection of wiki pages and publish them to a WordPress website. And what that means is that any education institution in the world would be able to easily produce and remix any of our courses for uh, hosting on an open source technology like WordPress. Looking at uh, the delivery side from the learner's perspective, they access our course materials uh, from the WordPress uh, site, the published site. Uh, for us, a, a, a key 
principle or a key philosophical value is that learners sh must be able to access all course materials without requiring a password. And, and so you will see um, you would be able to access any of our courses without requiring a, a, a password. What we also then do is uh, distribute our interaction technologies using a whole range of best of breed open source technologies for learners to interact with each other. And we have technologies that are able to syndicate or harvest uh, posts together in a aggregated course feed. And there's been a lot of talk about the so-called next generation learning systems, the component based systems. And uh, th this is just an example of the suite of open source technologies that we use to assemble personal learning environments for our learners. Our you know, social media network is Mastodon, which is an open source alternative to Twitter. Learners um, you know, can post um, their reflections and, and, and keep e-learning portfolios on uh, blog sites that they control and maintain even after the course is finished. We have an internal commenting engine called WikiNotes. It's all open source. We, of course, integrate uh, annotations using Hypothesis. Uh, we use a social bookmarking technology that is powered by Semantic Scuttle, which is also open source, uh, similar to uh, Dejo. And we use the Discourse Discussion Forum engine. So you can see what happens is uh, learners interact on a whole range of different open source technologies that we are able to integrate together uh, in our course feed. And this brings me to the key reflection or the key challenge that uh, we, we have experienced in assembling these courses, working with faculty and academics all around the world. And I think it's the key challenge we're having to deal with is shifting from the notion of sharing to learn to learning to share. Um, most educators understand the value and are quite eager uh, to, to share their outputs in order to support learning. They understand the value of doing that. However, um, many academics actually don't know how to share effectively in open environments. I mean, consider, for example, comparing this to the free and open source software world. Any developer worth their salt when tackling a new software development, the very first thing that they would go and do is to go out and see what open source software is already available to integrate. Whereas many of our educators uh, tend not to go out and look first what OER is available or open access resources are available in order to remix. Uh, we have a number of challenges um, that we have to deal with in sh crossing this chasm. I mean, consider, for example, and I don't want to belabor this point, but just by way of illustration, if we are very, if we are serious about inclusion in open education, we should also make sure that we don't force our learners and educators to sacrifice their freedoms. Uh, consider, for example, I'm an open educator. I, I do not use proprietary software by choice. But in order to participate in this webinar, I was forced to save my presentation in a proprietary file format. I was forced to download proprietary software so that I could use the Flash plugin uh, that powers the back end of um, you know, the Adobe Connect system. So, I mean, these are challenges we need to think about in open education and our practices. Um, to what extent are we excluding people uh, through the choices of technology we are using? And I guess the key question we should be asking ourselves, is it appropriate to be aiming to achieve open goals through closed technologies? So let me just leave it there, and uh, hopefully there are a couple of questions um, that we can engage in some discussion. But thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening, and um, I look forward to any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, Wayne. I, would, I have to say that every time I, I hear your presentation, you have something new to say. So now you have your first year and these, uh, these degrees, uh, let's say, real, real degrees, real life degrees uh, taken uh, completely with a different approach. Actually, why is the uh, people, I'm asking uh, my colleagues and participants to, to write in the chat their questions. I have one question which is a, a fundamental question regarding, regarding your, your experience, I would say. 
uh, what you, you you started from scratch with a new approach and with a new institution, I would say, new network a few years ago, and and it seems to work. Uh, now, most of the participants, not only of this webinar, but of uh, European and I would say global higher education, are actually working in, in institutions that have from a few dozens to a few hundred uh, uh, years. So these are, uh, let's say, traditional uh, institutions that, have, as we have seen, uh, tend not to value innovation as we should, tend not to care so much about proprietary, non-proprietary, just they have other issues, let's say, in terms of, let's say, high management and, and governance. So the thing is, we, we heard today by three uh, professors working into uh, traditional universities, and now you come. And by, by listening to you, really, the answer comes to, to Anna Maria question. We should just scrap traditional universities and move to new models. Maybe that's the way. But that is not actually possible. We know that. So what's your advice for, uh, for given your experience uh, in your specific setting for for teachers that are struggling sort of in traditional and sometimes resistant environment? Yeah, uh, a, a very important question, Fabio. And um, you know, I, I don't think there are necessarily quick fixes or easy answers. Um, for us at, at the OERU, I think um, why we have been successful is because we value the university as institution. Uh, what the OERU network is aiming to do is we are not a disruptive innovation model that is trying to replace universities, but rather we are an innovation model or an innovation partnership that is focused on widening access to education, but at the same time saving the value of our conventional institutions. Uh, if there's one thing that characterizes the OERU network, it is the rigor of our planning. And to be quite honest, I don't think the university as institution is at risk. Uh, it is one of a handful of institutions that survived the Industrial Revolution and I'm convinced that the university will be surviving the knowledge revolution. But it is hard to innovate in higher education. Uh, we are a traditionally very conservative environment, and I think our conservatism has contributed to our success. The way we have worked with the OERU is not to innovate on too many fronts at the same time, uh, but rather to take small steps and do what we can with what we have in a way that is going to contribute to more sustainable education, not only for our learners, but more sustainable and efficient practices at our institutions. What the OERU network model enables us to do is to spread risk uh, in ways that no one institution is exposing themselves to any major risk, uh, but collectively we are going to achieve more than we can do alone. That's, uh, that's the key to success and it's at the same time an indication for traditional universities to, to, to take small steps, actually. Um, another question that uh, I can paraphrase from, from the chat has to do with uh, uh, your open educators. I mean, you have uh, different models with volunteering, with uh, by using only open source software, some of which actually, like Mastodon, I, in my opinion, works better than proprietary software, so it's not a matter of using second class stuff actually in this in many cases uh, the level is the same but what about your teachers so your teachers are the, the they come from the universities that are part of your network so at the end of the day they are they also have a traditional teaching life in my understanding yeah. so how do they transform yeah. like like superheroes when they enter into the OERU uh, mood is this do you see some uh, sort of double identity there or is this also improving the way they teach in their traditional life. Yeah. Our experience by and large has been with, I mean, obviously uh, different academics come to the table with different experiences, uh, different academics come to the table with different motivations around open education. Uh, but one thing is for sure, our model is a very incremental model. Uh, we accept all educators where they are. And uh, we, we work together as part of a learning process, one step at a time. And I can assure you the majority of educators that have been through an open design process um, build new skills and new capabilities 
that they're able to plow back into mainstream education. Um, there are many, uh, I mean, the many aspects in, in designing an open online course that are not not the same as a traditional course. Um, I mean, for just designing materials for Remix uh, has a number of requirements uh, that aren't immediately apparent if you don't come from that experience. But the open source model is one of working collaboratively together and learning together. Um, we, we, we have a model in the open source world which is called, you know, rough consensus and running code. Uh, we, you know, in every course development, we try and achieve a rough consensus in terms of what we're going to do over the next week, and then we implement. And it becomes a learning process. And one of the key values for our partner institutions is by using our open source software stack, um, they are introduced to new technologies that could save millions of dollars on campus and reintegrate those technologies in mainstream operations uh, at campus. Um, and one of the things we do at the OERU is we actually publish the technical recipes for using all of our software that anybody can take and reintegrate back into the institutions um, to make uh, you know, operations more sustainable. Okay, thank you very much, Wayne. I think we have um, actually one minute left if you want to stay into the timing. So I would like to well invite everybody to visit the OERU.org website for the practical questions. Just one, one, uh, one question by Lina. Are the OERU courses only in English or you tackle other languages? Um, a very good question. Uh, at this stage, our courses are only in English, um, largely because we are tackling a, 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 a big complex problem. And, you know, integrating multilingual teaching would have introduced a layer of complexity, I think, um, that would be hard to deal with. But there's nothing to preclude anybody having conversations with us in terms of how one might take this forward. I mean, we will share anything we've done with any language that wants to replicate uh, what, you know, what we've been doing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I would like now, starting with you, Wayne, since I have you here on the on the screen, uh, to give uh, a, a, the, the word to every one of our four speakers for a one sentence or a couple of sentences. And the main question would be: I mean, you are open educators, let's say, in uh, in different uh, in different ways. Either you are integrating MOOCs, either you are leading actually one like Wayne, one of the most open networks in terms of uh, I would say global. Uh, or you are, let's say, and I think all of you, including Wayne, you are struggling with the system because actually the system started by not being open because of of a different uh, of a different time uh, and a different context. Now the question is, if you had the possibility to change one thing of the system, so you go to really uh, the Minister of Education, the European Commissioner or think of your rector or the conference of rectors of your institution and you think there could be one thing to be changed, one thing they would say yes to, you know, by definition. What would you, what would you ask them, what would you tell them that, the mo that is the most important thing to be done in order to, I would say, transform educators into open educators, empower educators towards openness. We've heard uh, a number of things about uh, institutional support, stakeholders networking, recognition, and uh, lack of awareness. But what would be your shot, Wayne? I think if there's one thing that we need to be doing at a global scale is returning to the core values of education, uh, and that is to share knowledge freely. If we get that right, everything else falls into place. Okay, that's great. One sentence that I will I will keep for the, not only for the notes of this webinar, but for, for many more things. Um, Carmen, can you jump in for a second? Um, my idea would be to be able to officially recognize uh, the courses which have uh, a blended approach because um, now we have to provide a lot of papers in order to accredit a course, to have uh, a book, uh, to have a number uh, of uh, hours 
in uh, the classroom and so on. But uh, the online activity is not uh, officially recognized. Okay, so officially recognized blended co blended and online courses. This would would trigger a big yes. change into the system. Thank yes. you very much, um, Micha Michaela. Can we have your shot? An opportunity. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, we we got got uh, sorry, I said just one sentence and just one issue. Um, I would go with a lot of. A lot more, of course, um, financial uh, support would be uh, something that's uh, very, very necessary. But uh, I would go with formal support, something in uh, the direction that Karen said. And um, su support recognition uh, of collaboration, because what I'm hearing from uh, Wayne would be actually a collaboration on, on a uh, European level, let's say, in a way, um, so we can create um, open educational resources for European field. If, if you you can understand what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Anna Maria. Uh, my first. Uh sentence is uh, learner first. I would like to start from learners and uh, possible support in accreditation and recognition of uh, learning stimulated doing uh, open educational resource, using open educational resource and the university involved in further education. I think this can be a simple uh, uh, law uh, rules with a big impact. Uh, we need to educate a mass of people. <laughs> I think there is some sort of agreement, I would say, or at least convergence among the most uh, on what are the most important things, which is good. At least, uh, and these are I mean, missions almost impossible, not completely impossible. So I think uh, we can start the day or end the day in the case of Wayne, with with some good feelings. I would like to thank everybody and sorry for being five minutes late, but I think it was worth staying here a few minutes more and uh, I'm inviting you to the next, uh, um, also to the next um, uh, webinar organized by Eden in occasion of the Open Education Week, which will be on Friday. You can see the link in the chat to all uh, um, to all our, our webinars and again to invite you if you can make it to our a next conference in June in, in Genova, another occasion, an occasion to keep on discussing these things also in, in person. I would like to thank uh, Anna Maria, Carmel, Michael and Wayne, our four distinguished speakers, uh, and uh, to wish everybody a, a good continuation of a fantastic Open Education Week 2018. Bye-bye.